All right, chapter 15, the microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity. Okay, so uh, one of the things I want you guys to make sure, make sure you guys do, actually all three of these things are really kind of important, okay? Uh, uh, pathogenicity is the ability to cause disease, okay? And virulence is the degree of pathogenicity, how much disease it can actually cause. Okay, so um, the portals of entry, okay? Um, mucous membrane, skin, uh, the parenteral root, okay? Um, which is basically what happens when you cut yourself, right? Um, most pathogens have a preferred portal of entry, okay? Uh, like fecal oral, or through the uh, nasal epithelium, okay, um, through vectors, et cetera, et cetera, okay? All right, so let's talk about um, a couple of things, ID50 and LD50, okay? ID50 is an infectious dose for 50% of the population, okay? Um, it measures the virulence of a microbe, okay? So um, if I went around the room and injected everybody with an ID50 of smallpox, okay, what does that suggest? Well, hopefully you realize that it would be about half of you guys would get it and half of you guys wouldn't, okay? So this is kind of the important number. Uh, the 50% number is kind of the most important because I can I can take a massive amount of smallpox and inject it into all of you guys, and maybe one of you guys won't get it, but the rest of you guys will, and no matter how much I inject, like uh, that one person still won't. Or I could use very, very, very minute doses and all of you guys will be normal except one person. The, the best number is the one in the middle, right? Where you infect half and don't infect half. That's the most accurate representation of how infectious something is. And also for LD50, how lethal something is. Okay, um, LD50 is the lethal dose for 50% of the sample population. So, um, it measures the, the potency of a toxin or a, or anything else. Um, so uh, if I inject you guys with smallpox, um, the LD50 isn't 50% of you guys getting smallpox. It's 50% of you guys dying from smallpox. Okay. Um, you can use this on, on, on viruses, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the best the best thing this measures is toxins. How much botulinum toxin does it take to kill you? Um, how much uh, shingle toxin does it take to kill you? How much staphylococcal enterotoxin does it take to kill you? Okay. Um, and these actually, um, if you look at the numbers, the smaller the number, the more lethal it is, okay? So um, for skin, okay, um, to get through the portal into the skin, you only need 10 to 50 endospores, okay? So if you have a cut in your skin, it's very easy to get anthrax. Um, that's why if you cut in your skin, you'll, you'll dig in the soil and crap, right? Because that will lead to infection, no problem. When you inhale it, you need about 10,000 to 20,000 endospores, right? That's like uh, a thousand times more or about hundreds of thousand times more, okay? And then for ingestion, you need 250,000 to a million, so about another hundredfold more um, to get to the same risk of infection, okay? So, um, you know, there's anthrax, um, can easily spread through skin and uh, um, puncture wounds and stuff. 
Okay. Um, toxins. Okay. So if you look at this, okay, um, you can imagine which one is more toxic, right? So one of the questions I ask is give you LD50 of these guys and go which one's more toxic. The answer is the, the one that's the lowest number here because it takes less bunch of lighter toxin to kill an average person than shingle toxin than staphylococcal toxin. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. One of the things that a pathogen has to be able to do is get to the host tissue and then stay there. Like it doesn't do you any good to just get to the host tissue and wash off. You have to be able to stay there. That's a that's an adhesion. Okay. Um, so there's adhesions on the pathogen that bind to receptors on host cells, either through the, like nucleolic okay, primary or the spike proteins and stuff. Okay. Okay. So there has to be adhesions on the pathogen that allows it to cling to something so it doesn't wash off. Okay, so uh, make sure you kind of understand this, this. Number three, um, I'll explain this one. Uh, how will it drug that binds metals on human cells? So th these are, we have a lot of sugars called metals on our cell surface. Uh, and a lot of adhesions attached to metals. So if you have something that already attaches to metals, um, it would actually prevent the pathogenic bacterium from attaching to metals. Okay. Okay. Um, or sorry. Uh, these guys, um, you definitely, definitely have to know um, this one. Okay. Okay, um, we talked a little bit about glycocalyx, but we just kind of mentioned it a little bit. Okay. Um, one of the things about glycocalyx is, is that it's kind of slippery and, and it allows um, the bacteria to kind of prevent phagocytosis somehow, some way, and they do it slightly different ways, okay? Okay. Um, so all components, okay? The M protein and the uh, streptococcus pyrogenes um, permits uh, phagocytosis, the OPA protein, allows attachment to host cells, so it stays there. And of course, um, you guys already know the uh, mycolic acid um, resists digestion, um, the waxy layer around TB actually uh, prevents digestion. Okay. Um, so uh, the enzyme that it secretes, okay. Um, Coagulases and kinases, they seem to do different things. Uh, coagulase causes a blood clot to form. Okay, uh, they coagulate fibrillogen by turning it into fibrin. Okay, that helps coagulate things around them and keeps them away from white blood cells. But then afterwards, they have to digest their way out of it, so they start secreting kinases that digest the fibrin clots. Okay. Okay. The hyaluronidase. 
Okay, um, like just a polysaccharide that holds cells together, and this is especially true of the um, the epithelium. Okay, um, collagenases break down collagen. IgA proteases destroy IgA antibodies. IgA is a special type of antibody that is secreted to the outside. So um, having an IgA -ase, um, IgA protease or IgA -ase, it breaks down IgA. So the antibodies that are trying to prevent you from getting through on the outside are destroyed. Okay. Okay, uh, energetic variation. Uh, pathogens alter their surface energies, um, and therefore the antibodies are rendered ineffective. For example, the flu virus, um, you, you, like, there's a yearly different flu vaccine, and that's because the yearly flu vaccine is targeted toward the energies on the surface of the flu. And if you target the antigens on the surface of the flu, all the flu virus actually has to do is change the antigens on the surface of the flu virus. And it, the vaccine no longer works. Okay, the antibodies no longer work. Okay, so every year we have to figure, figure out very quickly what type of antigens are on this year's flu virus and then build up a response against that. Okay, um, trypanosomes and other um, protozoans are incredibly good at energetic variation as well. They, they, they can all of a sudden just switch antigens on their surface. And um, it looks to the body, it looks like it's a new infection. So I, they actually have to develop a secondary, a whole new response to it. And then they all of Pathogen does is switch the antigen we have, and then the body has to build up another immune response to it, and eventually the body wears out. Okay. Okay. Um, so penetration is uh, okay. So in many things, uh. Our surface proteins um, by, produced by the bacteria that rearrange the actin filaments of the cytoskeleton. Um, they cause the membrane of the cell to ruffle and that allows the bacteria to get through. Okay, um, they use actin to move from one cell to the next. They can take a so actin is a long chain of actin molecules. Okay, and if I can rearrange that, then I can hijack that system to move where I want to move. In fact, I can use it to get from one cell to another through the gap junctions. Okay, um, and that's what uh, Shingella and Listeria do. Okay, um, they can also survive inside phagocytes. Okay, so what actually happens? Okay. Um, I'm sure you guys kind of know this already, but the first thing that happens is a white blood cell will try to engulf a bacteria, right? When it engulfs the bacteria, what it does is it puts it in a little bubble. That bubble is called a phagosome, okay, phago E, right? So the phagosome, and then it attaches a lysosome to it. The lysosome will have enzymes, that are very acidic and will digest away the, everything that's inside the phagosome, including the bacteria, okay? So there are three ways around this. One, you don't care about the low pH. You, you resist the low pH and the digestive enzymes. Two, as soon as you get into the phagosome, you get yourself out of it, okay? So you jailbreak out of it. And three, you prevent the lysosome from fusing with the phagosome, okay? The human body has many surveillance mechanisms for detecting pathogens. 
Phagocytes are able to detect foreign cells by looking for molecules on the surface of those invaders that are not found in the human body. Adaptive defenses, such as B-cells, antibodies, and cytotoxic T-cells, are looking for a specific antigen on the surface of the invaders. If a microbe can hide from these surveillance methods, then it's more likely to reproduce within the body. When immune surveillance cells, such as macrophages, are looking for invaders, they search for surface molecules that are not found on host surfaces, such as peptidoglycan. Capsules that surround some bacteria are usually composed of polysaccharides similar to molecules found on host cells. Thus, when a macrophage encounters an encapsulated bacterium, it doesn't recognize it as foreign and ignores it. This is a strategy used by Streptococcus pneumoniae, a common cause of bacterial pneumonia. Even if a bacterium is engulfed by a phagocyte, it may not necessarily be killed. The tuberculosis bacterium is able to survive within a phagocyte by preventing the fusion of lysosome and phagosome. This keeps the digestive enzymes away from the bacterium. Bacteria such as Shigella and Listeria can actually escape the phagosome and live within the cytoplasm of the phagocyte. Even if the phagosome does fuse with the lysosome, some microbes are not affected by lysosomal activity. Leishmania, a protozoan, is able to resist the lysosomal enzymes. Legionella and some staphylococci inhibit the pathway that leads to oxidative killing within a phagocyte. Some bacteria, including the tuberculosis bacterium, actually reproduce within the phagocyte. Several different types of microorganisms are capable of hiding from host defenses by changing their surface antigens frequently. These changes may occur as a result of mutations or genetic recombination. RNA viruses such as influenza virus or HIV frequently exhibit antigenic variation on their surfaces. Trypanosoma, the organism that causes sleeping sickness, has a surface glycoprotein that undergoes frequent changes. In all of these cases, it is the survival of the fittest. The microbes with the undetectable antigens are the ones that are least likely to be detected and most capable of reproduction. Okay, well there's a memory ruffling, okay. So you can see it allows the entry by ruffling through the membrane. Okay, so biofilms we already went over. Um, so the answer to the number 15.5 is no, right? You you make it what you use it one at a time. Okay. Okay. Okay, so again, all three are important. Okay. Um, 12 is important and 13, not so much. Um, and 14, definitely. Okay. okay, so iron is required for most pathogenic bacteria. Okay, so our cells need iron, but it doesn't need a lot of iron, but iron is very, very important um, to keep away from bacteria because bacteria need iron too. And that's one of the hardest things for them to get a hold of. So um, there's there's a lot of fight over iron inside your body. Okay, it's actually a really cool thing. Because that's what they want to limit access to. That's what bacteria want to get access to. And if they reach open your cell, your red blood cells have a lot of iron in them, right? So they want to reach open your red blood cells to get access to that iron. But your heme groups and stuff are, are very good at holding on to the iron. So there's a big fight, okay? And cytophores are actually proteins that are secreted by pathogens that bind and, and sequester iron away from the host cell and keep it for the bacteria. Okay. 
One way in which pathogenic bacteria are able to create an infection and cause disease is to have certain traits called virulence factors that help them attach to or penetrate the host tissues and to escape host defenses. One group of virulence factors are enzymes secreted to help the pathogen to penetrate tissues, allowing them better access to nutrients and helping them to reproduce. Cells that make up body tissues are held together by molecules like hyaluronic acid, a polysaccharide that forms a chemical glue. Some pathogens, such as certain Streptococcus species and Clostridium perfringens, secrete an enzyme called hyaluronidase that breaks apart this glue and makes space for the bacterium to penetrate deeper within host tissues. Collagen fibers, found at the base of superficial tissues, are another barrier to pathogens. Pathogens like Streptococcus and Clostridium secrete collagenase, an enzyme that helps them to pass through the barrier by digesting collagen fibers and allowing these pathogens to move deeper into the body. Streptococcus pyogenes, which causes strep throat and necrotizing fasciitis, secretes an enzyme called streptokinase that digests blood clots by breaking down the fibrin proteins that provide the structure of the clot. For this reason, streptokinase is sometimes called fibrinolysin. Some strains of Staphylococcus aureus secrete staphylokinases that do the same thing. Both of these species of bacteria live on the skin the ability to dissolve blood clots allows them to penetrate deep beneath injured skin and cause a more serious infection. Okay. Enteric or intestinal pathogens possess a number of virulence factors. Two of these pathogens are salmonella, the etiologic agent of salmonellosis, and typhoid, and shigella, which causes shigellosis. Both bacteria are able to live within their host cells as parasites. Let's see how virulence factors help them to do so. Salmonella has flagella that help it to move in its environment. Proteins on these flagella inhibit phagocytes, as do other proteins in its capsule and cell wall. It also has fimbriae for adherence to the luminal surfaces of intestinal walls. It uses a specialized secretion system to inject proteins called invasins into the epithelial cell that cause rearrangement of the actin in its cytoskeleton. This rearrangement causes the membrane to ruffle, allowing the bacterium to be engulfed. Once salmonella is engulfed by the intestinal cells, it remains in the vesicle, where it triggers an inflammatory response causing electrolytes and fluids to leave the cell. This results in secretory diarrhea. Inflammation also causes leukocytes to migrate to the region. When the bacteria are released from the epithelial cells, they either enter the bloodstream directly or by moving into phagocytes where they can grow. Shigella, unlike Salmonella, lacks flagella and cannot attach to the intestinal epithelial cells. They can only enter by attaching to M cells, which are specialized antigen sampling cells of the intestine. Shigella also uses a secretion system to inject molecules that cause the M cell to take it inside. Once Shigella is inside the M cell, it passes through to the other side within a vesicle. The secretion system has also released proteins that induce inflammation, bringing phagocytes to the area. Shigella can survive within the phagocytes by escaping the phagosome. The inflammatory response breaks apart the junctions between epithelial cells, allowing Shigella to spread. Another virulence factor of Shigella allows it to polymerize the actin molecules within the epithelial cells into a tail-like structure that propels it from one cell to another. Okay. Um, production of toxins. Okay. So toxins, by definition, is a uh, is a substance 
that's produced by microorganisms whose the purpose of which is to harm you. Okay, um, produces fever, cardiovascular problems, diarrhea, shock. Okay. Toxigenicity is a ability of microorganisms to produce a toxin. Some of the microorganisms we, we study, they're by themselves not toxinogenic. They get their toxins from bacteriophages and stuff. Okay, uh, toxemia is the presence of the toxin. That's the definition, toxication. <coughs> Intoxication is the presence of toxin. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, there are two types of toxins: endotoxin and exotoxin. Okay. Endotoxin, or sorry, let's talk about exotoxin first. Okay. Exotoxin is excreted from the bacteria. Um, it's soluble. It destroys whole cells. It destroys inhibits metabolic functions. It is designed to harm you in some way that is beneficial to the, the bacteria. Okay. Um, our defense against toxins is an antitoxin, so an antibody designed against a specific toxin. Okay. A toxoid is a <coughs> A toxoid is an inactivated toxin. Okay. Okay. So here you go. This is um, botulinum toxin. Okay. It's actually made inside a bacteria and it's actually secreted with the purpose of trying to kill you. Exotoxins are bacterial proteins that are secreted by a living bacterium into its surroundings. In a host, these exotoxins circulate and cause damage to host cells in various ways. Exotoxins can cause severe damage or death at very low concentrations. Exotoxins can be classified in different ways. One method classifies the exotoxins by the area of the host that is infected. For instance, neurotoxins are toxins that affect the function of neurons. Tetanus and botulism are caused by species of clostridium that secrete neurotoxins. Enterotoxins, like those secreted by the cholera bacterium, affect the lining of the intestinal tract. The term cytotoxin refers to an exotoxin that kills or seriously damages host cells in general. Corani bacterium diphtheriae is a bacterium that secretes a cytotoxin that inhibits protein synthesis in host cells. Exotoxins can also be classified by their structure and function. This classification scheme has three categories, AB toxins, toxins that disrupt membranes, and superantigens. Most exotoxins are proteins with two domains, A and B. The A domain of the exotoxin is an enzyme that has a particular function. The B domain of the exotoxin is the binding component. It binds to a specific receptor, usually a carbohydrate on the host cell. Once the B domain attaches to the host cell, the host cell uses endocytosis to bring the exotoxin inside. Then, the B domain opens a pore in the endosome, allowing the A domain to escape into the cytosol, where it can inhibit protein synthesis or interfere with the host cytoskeleton. This usually results in death of the host cell. Membrane-disrupting toxins exert their effect without entering the cytosol. They can form protein pores in the host plasma membrane. or they can disrupt the phospholipid portion of the membrane. In either case, the cell lyses. Oh. Superantigens are bacterial exotoxins that stimulate an excessive immune response. First, it causes a proliferation of T-cells. Then it causes the T-cells to release excessive amounts of cytokines, which can stimulate fever, inflammation, and shock. This very intense response could lead to death. 
The toxin secreted by Staphylococcus aureus in food poisoning and toxic shock syndrome is an example of a super antigen. Okay, so exotoxin. So now you should definitely know what an AB toxin is, exotoxin is. Okay, uh, these are specialized exotoxins. I mean, a lot of them do exactly what they say they do, like cytocytin, sorry, leukocytin, leuka, white blood cells, cytin, suicide, right? Kills, kills white blood cells. Um, Hemolysin. Vice is open uh, erythrocytes. Okay. 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 So. Okay. Endotoxins are not trying to kill you. Okay. That's the, that's kind of the fundamental difference. So you need a larger amount of endotoxins to actually cause harm. Um, <coughs> and the cell doesn't actually produce, the bacteria doesn't actually produce um, endotoxins. It produces, okay, um, a light bulb poly. First of all, endotoxins are only found in gram negative bacteria. The gram negative bacteria have a lipid layer around the um, cell wall, okay. <coughs> Call it LPS. Um, what it does, okay, is uh, when it dies, the cell wall breaks apart and releases the endotoxins. Okay. Um, the endotoxins they trigger a massive immune response. Okay. Um, Endotoxins. endotoxins are a part of the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacterial cell wall. The endotoxin is the lipid A portion of the lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, in the outer membrane. Endotoxins are only released from the bacterial cell when the cell dies or during cell division. When bacterial endotoxins are liberated, often during phagocytosis, they stimulate macrophages to produce cytokines called interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 is a protein messenger that travels to the hypothalamus in the brain, causing production of prostaglandins. Prostaglandins cause fever, an early sign of an infection. Endotoxins and interleukin-1 also help to stimulate phagocytosis complement activation, and antibody production by B lymphocytes. When endotoxin is released in large amounts or within the bloodstream, it can have more serious and even deadly effects. Massive amounts of cytokines, particularly interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor, cause loss of fluid from capillaries and vasodilation, both of which cause a lowering of blood pressure, often to dangerous levels, leading to shock. These same cytokines also stimulate blood coagulation, which makes the shock even more severe. This or meningococci in the bloodstream or spinal fluid. All right, hopefully that makes sense, okay? Because if it doesn't, ask me to explain it um, in other one of the classes, okay? Um, The ALA assay is the test that's used to test for endotoxins. Um, it, it comes from the, the blood of horseshoe crabs. That's why horseshoe crabs are... Okay. You drain their blood and you, and you do this with them. Okay. Okay, uh, so like I said earlier, um, the plasmids can carry genes for toxin production, blah, blah, and you can also be carrying a prophage, okay? And that's called lysogenic, okay? 
Okay. Um, okay. Alpha and beta interferons. So we'll skip this page. Don't worry about psychopathic effects. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll see later on what they are anyway. Alpha and beta interferons are produced by, um, I don't know why it's doing this. Okay, um, let me see what the hell is going on. All right, um, hopefully there was a big crash, so um, hopefully I have picked up exactly where I left off. If not, I'll have to record the first part of it again. Sucks because uh, I'm almost done. Okay, alpha and beta interferons, okay, are produced by virally infected cells. Their their whole job um, of alpha and beta interferons is to not to protect themselves. They're already infected. Um, their job is to protect the other cells around them. Okay, and they protect neighboring cells from viral infections by inhibiting the synthesis of the viral proteins and the host cell receptors and signaling pathways that allow the virus to get in the first place. Okay, and then they they kill the virus protecting cells by apoptosis. Okay, they also commit cellular suicide. But before that, they send out signals that tell that basically tell the neighboring cells to like hide, quiet down the signal in pathways. Okay. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, fungal infections, so the metabolic products, um, especially the um, muscarine, Okay, um, and stuff like that. Okay, so ergot um, are alkaloid toxins that cause hallucinations. Um, <clears throat> so, mycotoxins are produced by mushrooms and, and uh, neurotoxic colloidin uh, and emetin are, are particularly um, toxic. Okay in very low amounts, so eating one mushroom can actually kill you. Okay. Ergot is actually really interesting. Um, it's a fungus that grows on, um, hold on one second. It's a, it's a fungus that grows on crops, 
and particularly uh, wheat, okay, um, or barley, okay. Um, so I'm sure you guys have probably heard of the Salem witch trials, okay. Uh, the Salem witch trials were actually brought on by ergot poisoning, um, along with the religious fervor of the time, okay. So what happened was this, okay. If you're if you're a small farmer in New England, the worst time that you have to live through is early spring. Okay, because that is when you, you literally have to start start planting crops, but you don't have like there's no food available because you've eaten through your winter storage, so there's very little food available. So whatever's left, you eat. Okay, there's no new crops yet. There's no, so you, you're basically down to the leftover, like whatever you have left over. And what they realized after looking at the weather patterns at the time was they, they had a very wet um, winter, very wet, very warm winter. And that allowed the ergot to actually grow a lot. And ergot and large amounts of in large amounts cause hallucinations and and so who are the people who who first got like who were first arrested as witches well there were the poor women okay and the reason why there were there were poor women was because um women generally at that time were more poor okay and, and you know Equal rights and stuff, but at that time they didn't have that. So, and they were limited in the amount of food what they could eat. So they they ate um, the rotting rye wheat, okay, um, and they got one of the symptoms is hallucinations, okay, um, and stuff. And that's where the, the it all started, and then it took off from there because of the re religious fervor. But the, the the first things were actually real, and they were they were there were people suffering from hallucinations, and you know you hallucinate what you think about, right? So if you if you if all you just in your mind is religion, then you you hallucinate that, okay, and then um, et cetera, et cetera, okay. All right. Uh, protozoans, okay. Uh, like they said, they're, they're really strong in antigenic variation, okay. Um, uh, how many helmets, um, they use the whole tissue for growth. They produce large masses, which cause cellular damage, waste products, etc. Okay. Uh, some algae produce a neurotoxin called. Uh, Saxon toxin. Um, this is why, like, when there's out, so uh, you won't, unless you purposely eat algae, you won't eat enough algae to get this poisoning. But shellfish, shellfish are filter feeders, so they filter a lot of seawater to get whatever nutrients they want, and so they they concentrate a lot of toxin from the algae. So that's why you shouldn't like. When you have algae blooms or red blooms and, and stuff like that, um, you should avoid eating shellfish. Okay. All right. Portals of exit, the respiratory tract, right? Coughing, sneezing, uh, the GI tract, feces uh, and saliva, right? The front and back and GI tract, the urogenitory tract. Uh, urine secretions from the penis and vagina, um, so sexually transmitted diseases and stuff. Okay, um, the blood, um, needles, mosquitoes, syringes, all these things that puncture into the blood, etc. Et okay. Oh, okay. So hopefully that makes sense, and hopefully. It actually recorded the first part.